thisiscouch.com, streaming wellness into your lives. You're listening to A Quirky Journey, the healthy family podcast with your hosts, Joe Witten and Fuad Kassab. Welcome to yet another episode of A Quirky Journey. This is your host, Fuad Kassab. And today I don't have your favorite person on the planet, Joe Witten, but I have your second favorite person. I'm sorry, Elise. <laughs> <laughs> it's filling in for Jojo. How's it going, Elise? Hi, very good. How are you? Yeah, doing great. I'm on day four of my um, broth fast. It turned out to be a little bit more uh, challenging than I thought to keep my head working throughout this period of fasting, and I've had to turn it into intro gaps, stage one kind of thing. But I'm doing great. Thank you so much for asking. How are you doing? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. I just had a massive green juice and so that's got me feeling fresh my mind is clear ready to go with the drilling you're going to give me with all the questions i'll take it easy <laughs> before we get into the detail tell me a little bit about the green juices what what have you got in yours so in my juice today i got my veggie box today i got a lovely local veggie box and it's my right. favorite day of the week i pretty much run out to him as soon as he arrives with it Mm. And he pulled out a beautiful bunch of spinach and he said, look, I brought you a bunch of flowers. <laughs> I know. Isn't it? Yeah, I love my veggie man. Um, and so my juice had some beautiful spinach in it, some zucchini, uh, some golden beetroot, some carrot, lemon, mint from my garden that I've been growing and some parsley. And it was really like yum. Salad. Yeah, it was my salad juice and it's exactly what I needed today. It's nice and hot up here. Uh, wonderful. And um, like no sweetener? Like what's the deal? What, what kind of sweetness did you get? Did no, you- the carrots. For me, that's sweet. I will okay. sometimes use things like a bit of apple or something. I just don't have any at the moment. But yeah. it was honestly sweet enough with the golden beetroot and the carrot. For me, that was sweet enough. And I really like lemon in a juice. So I put, I think it was like three quarters of a lemon I had in the fridge and I put that in. So yeah, I love yeah. lemon. Yeah, I well, love lemon in juice. You got like the, you know, every other flavor. The citrus is just kicking in. But hey, what do you do with the extra fiber that comes out of the juice? Do you just chuck it out? Yeah, sometimes I'll compost it or I'll, sometimes I'll make things with it. I, I'd love to say that I often make things with it, but it just doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't always happen. So I compost it. What but, do you make um, with it when you do well, things like breads using the pulp, you can make biscuits and different things. You can, um, I've made crackers with it. So, I've, yeah, I could share a recipe um, of some yeah, crackers or different nice. things you mm. can make with the pulp. Yeah. And do you have like a cold press juice thing or is it? I like do. A, yeah, okay. Yes. Cold press juicer. I like Kuvings. That's the one I use. They, okay. don't, pay, they don't pay me to say that. It's just, I just like that one. <laughs> Yeah, so um, what's the difference between cold pressed juice and like another juicer? What, why, why so, would you cold press? So, cold pressed juicer masticates the juice, which means it chews it up. So, it's called a masticating juicer. And that's rather than other juices that pulverize it. When they pulverize it, they actually can break down the cell walls of the nutrients that you're trying to get from the juice. So, the best kind of juice you can have is cold press. It's a slow juicer, it's where there's just a um, like it looks like a big plastic screw inside it, turning up the vegetable and pressing it rather than a blade that's chopping all up. Hmm. Okay. So yeah, that's why I have juice. So yeah. it's just a bit more gentle in the juicing process. It doesn't. Um, yeah. Yeah. Preserves. Not yeah. Yeah. Not violent. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. preserves preserves the nutrients you're actually trying to get out of the juice. So when you're pulverizing it with a blade you're actually destroying those nutrients you're trying to get from the juice. So cold yeah. pressing is the way to really get the nutrition from the juice. I guess it's also less oxidative stress perhaps, you know, as it goes through like a gentle squeeze process. It's not... Yeah. Really, yeah, right. Okay. So it keeps all the polyphenols that are the, you know, protective inside. Yeah. 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 And uh, how often would you have a juice like that? Um. Uh, I, a couple of times a week would be nice. So, and I'm at a point now in my journey that it's really when I feel like it. I do these kinds of things when I feel like it. I don't mm. kind of set out a, this is how many times a week I do it. So, today I was just feeling like I needed some detox support. So, I went to the spa 
which is nice, and spent half an hour in the sauna, had a nice sweat, and then came mm-hmm. home and had the juice. So I wouldn't usually do that all the time, but it's just that today I felt like I really need a bit of detox support, clear my head, and so a spa and a juice was on the cards for me. So, so do you have like a regimented approach to the way that you deal with your diet or supplementation and things like that? Or are you now at this point where you can be, be a bit more in tune with what your body wants? Definitely in tune with what my body wants. So like you're doing with the fasting, it's doing something, it's feeling good, I want to keep doing it and so um, and just kind of following that. So I do a bit of fasting too now as well mm. and I find that for me with my cycle, uh, there's certain times in my cycle where fasting will feel better and certain times when Same. it won't. 100% for me. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we're all cyclical and, and I yeah. think a lot of people don't realize men are also cyclical. Um, so I know for the week leading up to my period, I definitely don't feel like fasting and the week following it. And then the other weeks I'll feel more like fasting. So there's so many things that play into how we're feeling and what's going on with our bodies that the best thing we can ever do is listen to that. And so that's, yeah, so that's where I'm at. I'm listening to where my body's at. Sometimes I'm eating mostly vegetables. Sometimes I'm eating lots of stocks and um, sometimes I'm doing lots of juicing and sometimes I'll have a run where I try and go to the spa every day for a week because I just really feel like I need it. Um, but yeah, so it's just kind of following where I feel like I'm at and trusting that. Mm. And um, how do you manage stress in your life? Um, well, I really see stress as not so much something that needs to be managed but something that is a, is a chosen response to things going on in your life. So that's really a place where I've, I've decided to come to with stress and what I've learned. And that's, it's really our choice how we respond to something. And that's what the stress is. It's not the situations themselves. So it's like you meet people that, you know, those kind of people that seem to just take everything as it comes and cruise through life and don't worry too much. And then there's the people that get really caught up about everything and tend to stress more. So mm. we, our personality really comes into play. And, and there's really a choice behind that. And you'll find the people that are more the stressy type of people will have more cortisol and the stress hormones pumping through their body than the people that just kind of take things as they come. So I really just try and be one of those people, <laughs> the ones that take things as they come. Sometimes it's a bit fake it till you make it and just yeah, right. pretend I can do that. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. But yeah, so that's I guess where I'm at is learning, yeah, learning to say no, really trying to please myself rather than other people and just know that that's more important um and yeah and just really think about when i'm if i am starting to get stressed in a situation to go is this life or death do i does my body need to be pumping uh stress hormones right now is that really important to have the house clean before my friends get here to you know, get somewhere on time to whatever it is, mm. um, you know, is my stress actually conducive to helping this situation or is it absolutely pointless? Gotcha. Um, yeah. yeah, so that's, that's, that's what I do there. Yeah, and good. go to the spa and drink juices. Yeah, that's all, all <laughs> contributing to lowering stress for sure. Because that's right. So like having your environment be um, really peaceful, like a spa environment, is definitely one way of reducing, reducing environmental stress. Because like if you're in a place that is busy with cars and noise and people or clutter and things like that, then your nervous system is activated around these areas. And then you can take yourself out of um, the stressful location into somewhere less stressful and your nervous system calms down. And then from there you can sort of, think more rationally and get your life a bit more organized, I find. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think if you have that in mind, then you can start creating, like start looking at your home environment and creating it around that. It's like not having too much stimulation and too much clutter. And I know you've been into that a bit as well, haven't you, the minimalism? Well, as much as I can, you know, like I'm, I'm a person who sort of keeps a lot of things just in case one day, uh, you know, analog phones are needed or, you know, things like that. You know? And uh, I'm trying to not to be that guy. And so a lot of my stuff I've given away or sold. Um, and I'm trying to keep my living space neat and tidy as well, which is very, very helpful to like my desk. Um, I just came back from Alice Springs and Darwin. 
and I came back and I had my bag here unpacked and um, it's sort of there's still stuff in it in my office and my I took a lot of stuff and put them on the desk and the desk was messy so I'm just trying to um, live with that for a few days and realize that hey I should have done that I should have fi- I should have cleaned up everything by now and today this morning I cleaned it all up and I feel so much better so, yeah it does feel good yeah I used to sort of leave it for much longer back in the days and now I'm much more conscious of the impact that it has on my health having a cluttered uh, workspace and living space and uh, it's just so much better and you know once you remove a lot of clutter from your environment it just becomes easier to tidy it up anyway so that's been really good uh, and I mentioned you know I've been um, doing the fasting that's sort of like an internal declutter I think of it because um, as you travel like you inadvertently go out for breakfast or lunch dinner that kind of stuff you know we don't get much time to um, to really cook and uh, it's nice also when you go out to sort of eat at the local restaurants and cafes, see the offerings there. Um, as healthy as we do eat, we end up, you know, sometimes having like eggs for breakfast with some gluten-free toast or something like that or something that they'll cook it with vegetable oil. And it's so, like, it's amazing to me how these days, how quickly my body starts feeling it when I'm not eating well, like my... my um, joints get a little bit more painful and I feel swollen and my head gets foggy and I'm, you know, really, really feeling the impact of industrialized food. So I got home and I was like, wow, you know, I'm just going to get back on track. And the fastest thing for me was to sort of do like a, an all checkout kind of thing, which is a broth fast. That's what I, that's how I think of it as like an internal deep brother. So I'll, uh, do a broth fast for four days and um, that helps my system get rid of all the stuff that has accumulated over the, the days that I've been traveling. Yeah. yeah it's and it's a, so good for the inflammation. I find that when I travel to, yes. that you just end up inflamed and it's amazing when you've been on a bit of a health journey, how much you can really feel inflammation when it comes yeah. on. Yes. You just feel that. And I, I feel the fasting. It's like, Within a day, just inflammation goes down. I'm like, yes, okay, I'm feeling good again. Totally. And the, the quickly you'll see it from the weight loss that you have because the body as it is inflamed, it'll hold on to a lot of water. Yep. And then, you know, you jump on the scales and you see like you've lost, you know, a few kilos in a couple of days. And you go, that's not really possible. If it's just uh, fat loss, you wouldn't be losing that much, but it's mostly water retention. And the water is in your body because of like the way it binds itself to uh, glycogen, for one thing, and then, uh, which is the stored form of glucose. And as your body is in a fasted state, it starts using up all that glucose, glucose, so you get rid of the water. But then there's also the inflammation in the tissue that is there to protect the joints and the tissues and things like that as well. And um, when the inflammation goes down, the water goes down. It's sort of like a swelling that happens systemically. Maybe you can see it. Some people get swelling in their legs or arms or face and things like that. Some people, you don't feel it, but it's there and it just comes out when you fast. And it's just incredible. Yeah. What's been your experience with fasting? Do you do much of it? Um, I do. I do it quite regularly now. And I think it's always important to clarify when we're talking about fasting that it's it's not something that everybody's ready for or would benefit from. And that's really something that to figure out on an individual basis. I think it's something everyone can potentially benefit from, but it's just making sure that you prepare for it properly and lead into it and make sure it's the right time in your journey to be doing uh, fasting, that the, your body will cope with it. Um, so with me, I've done, uh, I did do a four day, four night fast. Um, and that was incredible. That's probably the best I've ever felt was after that fast. I haven't done one of them again. I would really like to, it does take, it does take willpower to, um, keep going through longer fasts like that. It's well, not if you're sort of stuck in the middle of a forest. And, no, like, and, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so when i did that fast it was alone in the wilderness yes. and so there was no choice but to not eat food i wasn't lost it was intentional um 
And yeah, so trying to do that, I found trying to do that at home has been much more challenging because your brain really gets in there with, oh, you should eat because of this and this and this. Okay, I'll eat. Oh, damn it, I ate. Right. <laughs> you keep, you know, cooking for uh, yeah. Yeah. Me, you know, I did the I did the vision quest fast as well, and I had done one a few months before just to know that I can do a four day fast without dying. You know, and so yeah. I did it at home. <laughs> And Lainey, she was cooking all this delicious food and everything just smelled amazing. And then I'd get messages from Joe with beautiful pastries and cakes or, you know, anything like meat soups. And, you know, I just couldn't look at social media, couldn't play on my phone. Everything was making me salivate. It was crazy. Such a pavlovian yeah. response. And, yeah. Uh, but, um, yeah, the water fast was extremely, um, much more extreme, I think, than a broth fast. And, yeah, definitely. And, so I'm doing, I did a broth fast. Uh, my intention was to go for four days, but by the end of the second day, I felt like really good. And at that point where I could start adding things like egg yolks, so I started adding egg yolks into my broths. And then uh, yesterday was day three. I went through with the egg yolk broths until the evening. We went out for a Halloween get together and um, ended up um, having a little bit of steak as well. Uh, not not too much of it and i felt really really good after the steak like my body was definitely tired and needing some more sort of sustaining foods than just the broths and the, the egg yolks even though they're extremely nutritionally dense but i just had uh i needed a little bit more and i woke up today feeling fantastic so today i'm doing the, the broths with a little bit of pumpkin and egg yolk and i'll just slowly slowly ex- expand my diet over the next few days in a gap style. So yeah. I'll, just, I'll add a few more things. But also what I do add is I do add a little bit of garlic and grated ginger into my soups for flavor. And things like that. But, yeah, and that's a beautiful way to do it because whenever you're fasting, you should follow the when principle. So eat when hunger and choose naturally. So yes. it's, um, and when I talk about the willpower to fast, uh, you know, to do like four days, I found my body coped very well with it. It was my mind that was like, I want food. <laughs> um, not so much, you know, your body can cope really well if you prepare properly and your body's ready for fasting. But, you know, we are cyclical, as I said, and so there'd be certain points in my cycle that I wouldn't fast well. So you just listen to your body and like you did, you did got two, You said you were going to do a four-day broth fast. You got to day two and felt like your body needed something else and so you followed that and I think that is always a really important thing to keep in mind whenever you're doing something like fasting. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, like, because obviously I sort of social share publicly about this kind of stuff. There was a part of me that said, hey, no, you committed to a four day broth fast and um, you can't really, you know, like go back on it. You told everyone <laughs> on social media that you're doing that. And I thought, you know what, like, um, I think I remember the story about Gandhi. Yeah. Uh, um, he, I'm, I'm told, but he gathered all the armies um, to go attack the British. Um, so it was like there was going to be a revolution in India, and um, then he thought, "What am I doing? Like, I'm just going to go into a war, and so many people are going to die." And obviously, you know, he was a pacifist, so uh, he changed his mind and he told all the generals and like all the leaders around who were frustrated and angry, and they're like, you know, like how. How dare you? Like, all the armies here, they're all ready to fight. We're all waiting, you know, for you to give the, uh, the go-ahead. And how, like, how can you change your mind like that when we're all ready? And he said something like, in my commitment between truth and consistency, I must always choose truth. And I think um, this is one of the principles that I apply to my life. Is like, even though if, if I have, like, a big plan that I've put for myself, I have to re- re- leave room for a flexibility based on what the situation is bringing. So, you know, a four-day water fast was going to be my ultimate goal, but I found that actually doing it this way felt better and healthier for me than sticking to the four-day broth fast. And I'm feeling great now, and um, I can function, I can do so much stuff that I needed to do during the week that maybe I couldn't have done with the broth fast. So I think a lot of people will stick to something thinking that, um, well, ignoring the signals from their body just because they've made a rational decision to do a fast or go on a certain diet or uh, eat a certain way, choose, you know, a, a certain like low carb or vegan or something like that. And 
uh, out of principle, they can stick to something that the body has, is screaming out to them and saying, no, you need this or you need that. And um, it's really important for us to actually listen to what our body is saying and just do what it asks because that's what we're trying to look after here, the body and giving it the nourishment that it needs and the time that it needs to heal. So. Yeah. Absolutely. I think exactly what you're saying there comes into play in what I was talking about with dealing with stress and saying no to things and knowing when to have a stress response and when that it, it's not, you know, helping the situation is, I guess it, it's kind of the same thing that, um, you know, you might make a commitment to someone, you might say you were going to do something, but it's that listening to yourself with the, if you're too tired or mm. you just realize it's not going to work, that it's okay. It's okay to change your mind. Um, before we get into the questions that the listeners have, I'm just interested in maybe you giving us a rundown of what potentially you could benefit from doing something like a broth fast. And, and also, how do you decide whether to do it or not? Okay, so I'll start with deciding whether to do it or not. Um, and that really comes down to where you're at on your journey of healing. So for someone, for example, that's right in the midst of adrenal fatigue, they know they're really struggling, they're very sensitive, you know, the kind of person that even, like I even have clients that won't tolerate uh, broths at all because they're far too healing and they're that unwell that um, that they won't even that they, they can't even tolerate any amount of stock um, because it's just too healing for them and cause too much detox too soon for them. So that that's kind of really the first point of knowing whether or not you're ready to fast is how sensitive you are and how severe your health issues are. So um, and how how ready your body feels to cope with stress because fasting in a way is still putting some stress on the body um, and so it's just really knowing how sensitive you are and how able you are to cope with something like that. So for someone with uh, adrenal fatigue, if they're going and start doing fast, then their adrenals are going to crash and they're going to feel a lot worse. Uh, so for them, it's definitely not going to be beneficial. Um, and for when we start doing something like fasting, a lot of detoxing happens. So for someone that has a lot of toxicity, so can really we can kind of look at what uh, issues they are dealing with, what chronic diseases they're dealing with, um, as to whether fasting is right for them because they're going to end up having a lot of detox. So, for example, someone with rheumatoid arthritis uh, is going to have a lot of toxicity and if they were to start fasting, depending on their situation, that could really not be beneficial with how much they'll detox. And we know that detoxing does cause oxidative stress on the body. We need to be careful with how we detox and how we support that detoxing and making sure those pathways are, are working optimally so that we're actually clearing what we're trying to detox within our body and not just reabsorbing toxins that are going to cause more stress. So there's a few factors there in just making sure that your body's ready and able to cope with the fast. Um, and then it also comes to what kind of diet you're currently on. I wouldn't suggest someone who's on a sad diet just start fasting. Is that um, diet being a standard Australian yeah. diet? Yeah. Yes, and not just a diet that makes you sad, although I'm sure it would. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, um, yeah, so someone going from a standard diet straight into fasting, they might not necessarily see the benefits they want to see from doing the fasting and, and they're likely to really struggle with it. So leading into doing something like fasting, it would be ideal to be fat adapted. So fat adapted is when you're using fat as your primary fuel source. So people with a standard diet, they generally are, well, they're always, um, have carbohydrates as their main fuel source. So our body can utilize um, different fuel sources, carbs or the fats. It doesn't utilize proteins very well. Um, so carbs or fats. And um, when we're utilizing carbs as our primary fuel source, it's kind of like kindling on a fire, that it's that quick burning energy. And when we're using fat as our primary fuel source, that's the big log on the fire. That's the slow burn. 
that's what keeps us having nice level consistent energy level consistent blood sugar levels um, throughout the day and you'll find that appetite lessens so fasting is really something to lead into with that where you're not just going I'm going I'm I'm deciding to fast because I want to do fasting and then just starving yourself it will just put your body in starvation mode and you're likely to just put on more weight um, it's really something you want to lead into with I'm going to start you know getting fat adapted by eating a diet that's higher in fats the kind of fats we want to be having from pasteurized animals um, and lowering the carbs and not eating the processed sugars and um, refined carbohydrates um, and then you become more fat adapted where you'll start to use fat as your primary fuel source and then notice that appetite levels drop. You can go longer without eating, without feeling like your blood sugar levels are dropping. Um, and then you'll feel like a fast is, is more doable, that you're kind of getting to that point where you're pretty much already doing it if you forget to have lunch and you're out and you're busy and you find that you can go fine without food. Um, so then that's kind of the, a good place to get to to start doing some intermittent fasting um, where you might go 16 hours or 18 hours and um maybe not have dinner so you know have lunch that day then skip dinner and wait and and maybe eat breakfast a little bit later at 10 a.m or something um, and then you know you might have done an 18 hour fast so that's uh, something to start playing around with and just always keeping the principle in mind of when hunger issues naturally that we're not starving yourself so um and there that is there is a lot of learning to do there with understanding your body when it's you you know the car you, you might be craving sugars because you're actually detoxing um and it's the the opportunistic bacteria or the yeast overgrowth that's really craving sugar um so there's a little bit of learning and listening to your body and i think fasting is something you you start in that way get fat adapted start intermittent fasting and then start experimenting with longer fasts so then you can experiment with 24-hour, 36-hour fast and then look at the longer fast if that's where you want to go. And remember there is different ways to fast. You can water fast, you can broth fast, you can fast just by eating um, a, a smaller amount of food on those days. So there's lots of different ways to fast. Um, and I think, yeah, experimenting with something like broth fasting is a, is a really good one to start out with for sure. Um, how do people get fat adapted? So you get fat adapted by eating a high-fat, low-carbohydrate diet. So reducing, so cutting out the sugars, the refined carbohydrates. Um, it doesn't have to be ketogenic. So a lot of people will have heard of ketogenic. You don't have to be in ketosis to be fat adapted. So ketosis is just when we um when we're using fat as our primary fuel source there's something produced in our body called ketones and when those ketones get to a certain level we call it ketosis and that the body's in ketosis mm. so you don't and that's for di that can be there's not a set amount of carbohydrates that you've got to limit yourself to to be in ketosis everyone is different some people will be able to eat more carbohydrates and be in ketosis some people will have to eat less um, but yeah, so we're not necessarily talking about ketosis or ketogenic diets, which I guess everyone's probably hearing of at the moment. It's become quite popular. Uh, but just being fat adapted is having, um, just a low carbohydrate diet. So definitely grain free. I don't think you could really consider yourself fat adapted while you're still eating grains, um, cause they're quite high in carbs. So looking at just vegetables in a small amount of fruit. Um, that you could be in the fat adapted state and it's somewhere you'll start to it's it's really a learning experience because everybody is so different that it's when you're starting to see that you are eating less volume of food and able to go longer between meals finding that your energy is more balanced throughout the day that you're not getting those big cravings for carbs and those dips of energy that follow it um yeah, and that you'll start to feel like your body can experiment with fasting. And that's... It's also worthwhile mentioning like the amount of fat that you eat needs to increase as well. Like. Yeah, yeah. So it's eating high fat, low carb. And the so, fat will come from... So, past, yeah, pasture-raised animals, things like coconut oil, avocado, um, so some of those plant fats as well, um, and nuts and seeds. Yeah, so yeah, you're needing to kind of Look at how you're getting fat with every meal. Yeah. 
the one thing that people will do when they're um, switching to a grain-free diet is that they start focusing a lot more on the nuts as this textural rep- replacement, I guess, you know, for making things like baked goods and breads and that kind of stuff. The nuts do have a fair bit of carbohydrate in them as well. So they're like this kind of really interesting food which has um, a lot of carbs and a lot of fat at the same time. Very energy-dense uh, food. Do you think that they should be part of uh, the staples of a diet like that or they should be supplementary? Definitely supplementary. So if you're eating to like nuts and seeds, they're quite high in carbs as well. So um, they, well, not in comparison to grains, but they're still a source of carbs. So most people will find that if they're eating, if they're really relying on those in their diet, that you still won't, you won't really be feeling um, the benefits of fat adaption. So they're really just, you know, if you want to make a grain-free bread based on nuts, it's like I would recommend no more than a slice a day. It's your you kind of attitude changes towards you might have currently have two slices of toast mm-hmm. with eggs for breakfast or something like that. We're really used to that much higher um, carb intake and that it being the basis of meals. So it's really kind of flipping that. So you're seeing that as a little side. Um and really focusing on the bulk of your diet should be vegetables. I think the bulk of everybody's diet, no matter how they're eating, should be vegetables. Um, that's the absolute basis of non-starchy your diet, and then you build on that with your um, good quality proteins and fats. And um, and it's important to understand that fats very nutrient dense, so um, and calorie dense. Not that we really like to talk about calories, but I'll say more like energy, energy dense. So you you don't have to eat the same amount, like your volume of food. When we talk about it has to be high fat, it's not necessarily that the volume is going to be mostly fat. The volume will still be mostly vegetables, um, but the amount of fat you have, it's pretty much twice as dense in energy as the vegetables. So um, that kind of helps people get, a, get an idea that I would have a plate that's at least half filled with vegetables um, and then just like a piece of meat on top and then be adding fat to it like butter, um, yeah. cooking the vegetables all in butter and adding a bit of slab of a big slab of butter on top of a steak or something like that. So because a lot of people think it means super high protein, but that's really not the case. And um, with things like muscle meats, like say steak, um, what's your take on the quantity that someone can healthfully be taking in? So I think it's really hard to give an exact quantity and especially because it's so dependent on where you're at on your journey because I could say a quantity right now and then I know that my clients, a lot of my clients will be eating far more than that mm-hmm. with where they're at on their journey, for example, in the intro stages of GAPS. So when you're in the in- intro stages of GAPS, you do need a fair amount of protein um, because we, what the body's doing when you're in those stages is that it's pulling out second grade proteins that are in your body to replace them. So it's like this detoxing and retracing process where not only are we pulling out toxins, you know, if you've got a damaged gut and you've had health issues, then a lot of the proteins in your body are not the quality that they could be. So that's why our, you know, we might have joint pain, we might our skin might not be looking so great. And when you see someone go through the intro stages, gaps, they start looking really good um, and looking really healthy. And that's because your body is actually going through that process of retracing and taking all this really good quality proteins that you're putting in and going and pulling out the second grade stuff in your body and replacing it with these really high quality proteins. Mm. So someone in those stages of gaps actually has a high protein requirement and will be eating much more protein than I would than I would eat right now and that I would be, I wouldn't benefit from eating that amount of protein at the moment, but I did at that stage when I was in the intro phases and eating a lot of protein whilst I was healing. So in that kind of stage, protein requirements are high um proteins like glycine and proline and gelatin and collagen that are in the stocks they're what heals and seals the ulcerated and damaged gut lining so we have a high requirement for those for someone like me where i'm at now so years into a gaps journey lots of healing i'm now not on full gaps anymore i'm on a whole food nourishing traditional diet my protein intake is actually like as in muscle meats is actually quite low now. So I don't even eat it on a daily basis anymore. 
Um, and that can change as well. So I might go through phases where I don't want, don't really don't feel like any muscle meat. Um, and I, I might go days to weeks to even a month of not really eating any, but still eating plenty of fat. And then I might feel that, okay, now I really need, yeah, I'm feeling like I need um, some meat. And then my first go to will always be organ meats. And really getting in the organ meats and then I might feel like a steak, um, still drinking stock during those times as well, sometimes more than others. So it's really, I don't think there's ever a set amount you could give someone and say, this is how much protein you should eat a day yeah. or this is how, this is the, you know, I've, the, you probably heard that whole deck of cards size. Um, is like the the recommended amount of protein to have with each meal. I don't think, I think we would like to be given a guideline. A guideline because people people love guidelines, and that's really understandable why we like that as well. We like things to be black and white because then we know the answer. Um, but I don't think there is a black and white answer to that because it really comes down to where your body's at and and how you're feeling and. Um, and that's where working with a practitioner can really help because sometimes you might need a bit of a hand to understand and work out where that sits for you and what's the right amount. But I would say for someone that is um, not in those intro stages of healing, then it is likely they are eating too much protein because it is something that I see most people are doing. Amazing answer. Thank you so much. <laughs> My answers are long today, aren't they? Yeah, you're doing well. Um, all right. So we can probably, you know, dedicate a whole topic on exactly this, top, you know, this, this kind of conversation. But we do have a few questions from the listeners that I'd like to get to. And uh, I know you're also running out of time. So maybe we can dedicate 15 or 20 minutes before yep. the appointment. Um, so one question is how to proceed after a course of antibiotics. Maybe I can expand that and say how to proceed during and after. Okay, cool. So, um, when it, when it comes to that for a gaps person, there's not really much that you will change because you're really doing everything you need to do, um, by having probiotics and probiotic foods and stocks. So they're the kinds of things I'd be getting someone to have. So for someone that is just eating a whole food diet and they're taking antibiotics and they're wanting to know how what to do about that, I would say introduce, if you're not already, probiotic foods and a good quality broad spectrum probiotic. Um, and for someone and, – and, and meat stocks as well. So um, making and, and consuming meat stocks and stews and soups and that kind of thing. Um, and if there's a like overuse of antibiotics and there's a lot of damage, then gaps may be necessary and that will depend on the person and what symptoms they're having. Um, and for someone that's following gaps, then they're really doing everything they need to just kind of make sure the focus is on those fermented foods, probiotics and stocks, um, just so it can be really focusing in on it. Great. Um, we have a question about someone considering joining gut health program. So I'll just, before I get into the question, I'll just say, Joe and I have an online gut health program at gaps.quickcooking.com.au. And this one has a lot of information about all the food that you can eat during the different stages of gaps. We have recipes for every stage in the intro gaps. We also have um, tutorials, meal plans, videos, all sorts of stuff there. And also a, a large community of people uh, I think it's now two and a half thousand subscribers or so to the gut health program. So you access the Facebook page as well, which is for the, the gaps program and you have access to the community, which is a thriving community where everyone's asking questions and helping each other out because you're all on a similar journey. So that's at gaps.quickcooking.com. The question here is I'm considering joining the gut health program and commencing the gaps diet. However, in addition to IBS, I have SIBO, which is small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Would you know if this program such diet would still be suitable and effective? I have not discovered the cause of my SIBO yet, but it is probably a motility issue. 
Similar diets take up so much time and energy. I'm not wanting to start gaps if true healing of the gut could be impeded by the SIBO, which is too much bacteria in the small intestine. So um, the, I think the the focus here, the question is is probably trying to understand the difference between how gaps heals the gut and how it heals the small intestine. Um, okay. So uh, can you give us a bit of an idea on that? Yes. So... When it comes to SIBO, what's going on there is that where most of our bacteria is meant to reside in our large intestine and like the distal end, so the further kind of end of our large intestine. So um, we're not really meant to have much bacteria in our small intestine and our small intestine is closer to our stomach. Our large intestine leads into our bowel. Um, So... What kind of what goes on with gaps, people, is that there's damage to the microbiome that damages the gut lining and vice versa. Then there's there's too much toxicity in the body and lots of um, you know kind of the whole pathway of digestion is affected, including the stomach and how enzymes and acids and things are produced. So people with GAPS issues very often have low stomach acid. And when there's low stomach acid, it means that things can overgrow. So the acid in our stomach is meant to be quite high. And as our food is gets kind of mechanically chewed up in our stomach, our, our stomach kind of massages the food and mixes it with chemicals. And so it kind of mecha- mechanically and chemically um, digests the food in our stomach. And then that food, which is at that stage called a bolus, uh, travels into our small intestine and it's quite acidic. So the food moves from the stomach into the small intestine and so do some of the acids with it. So when there's enough acidity in the stomach, then that means that bacteria, pathogens, parasites, they're all kept low in the stomach and then in the small intestine as well because that acid is kind of moving through into the beginning of that small intestine um, before it becomes diluted as it moves along in the intestine. So with a good amount of stomach acid, we won't have overgrowth of pathogens and bacteria and different things in the stomach or in the small intestine because that's keeping it nice and healthy with those acids. So someone with SIBO has low stomach acid And that means that the acid is low in the small intestine as well. And bacteria can start overgrowing in places they're not meant to be. So we're not meant to have a lot of bacteria in our small intestine or in our stomach. So people with SIBO have um, the small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, have painful bloating when they eat certain foods. And that's because it's moving through into the small intestine and it's getting digested in a way it's not meant to and it's fermenting and all, all sorts of things mm. happening to it that's causing really um, a lot of discomfort and painful bloating. Um, that's often the felt... The function of the small intestine isn't to ferment food. It's really no. Uh, through the acidity, start breaking down the fats and the proteins. Yeah, and it's where, uh, you know, our... In our stomach, we get some of the bile and enzymes and the acids there starting the chemical digestion and that chemical digestion is meant to continue in the small intestine. So we're still getting some pancreatic enzymes and some bile will also lead into the small intestine from the liver. There's the bile ducts. So it's still meant to be all about the digestion there when we're not really fermenting or uh, there's not meant to be that interaction with bacteria just yet. That's meant to be happening further along. And so there's, yeah, lots of pain and discomfort when that's happening. And this is an issue that happens for a large percentage of GAPS people and they don't even know it. They just know that they get pain and discomfort when they eat, but they don't know that it's due to this. So other ways you would know that your stomach acid is low if there's hiccuping and burping after eating and that feeling of fullness, like you kind of eat, but there's a feeling of fullness. You kind of feel it up to your throat, like not a feeling like I'm full in the stomach, but a feeling like things are sitting there and they're not um, quite going down properly. So they're kind of symptoms of knowing that. Can I just press pause here and just interject maybe as well? Um, a lot of people who have acid reflux and are on proton pump inhibitors mm-hmm. to manage the acidity that they get in their digestive tract like going up to um, yeah. the mouth, um, that's also a sign of SIBO, correct? And that's usually being treated exactly the opposite way of how it should be. Treated. Exactly, yeah. Right, okay. So it's it's um it's not necessarily a sign of SIBO. We don't know that it's then led to, but it it would be a precursor to. We are mm-hmm. likely to then get SIBO because uh-huh. we we can see that. Um, the stomach acid is low. So that sounds counterintuitive. People are put on the protein pump inhibitors 
um, which um, that basically what that means is that it's inhibiting the acid production in the stomach. So things like Nexium. Um, when they're having acid reflux. But what's going on when you've got something like acid reflux is that stomach acid is low. We've had pathogens in starting to proliferate in the stomach that shouldn't be there. And then they actually embed themselves in the walls and the lining of the stomach and in the sphincters as well. So we have a sphincter between our stomach and our esophagus and it can affect the function of that. And then we have the uh, what acid we do have in the stomach leaking up into the esophagus where it shouldn't be. Mm -hmm. So it's not actually a case of too much acid in the stomach, but when people take protein pump inhibitors, it does help because we're bringing right down um, the ability of the stomach to produce any acid, um, which will then mean there is less going into the esophagus. But the cause of the acid going up into the esophagus is that the stomach acid is low, there is pathogens that have overgrown in the stomach, and they're causing that sphincter to malfunction mm -hmm. and stay open. And so there's thing, uh, acids leaking back up into the esophagus. So essentially it's making the issue much worse when you start taking the protein pump inhibitors. Because so you, it's all you're increasing the amount of bacteria that can then... Yeah, you lower, you, 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 yeah there's already... Yeah, there's already bacteria proliferating in there and then you're re reducing the acidity further so the stomach can defend itself even less and then it's going to, that bacteria is going to be even happier and and proliferate even more because and when the you need lots of starches and sugars yeah. and like that, it goes yeah. in the stomach it's and a, starts fermenting this stuff. Yeah, and it's, like, and it's a big party in there. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so that's kind of what's going on there. So to really answer that question though, SIBO is not something you need to particularly focus on when you're doing GAPS. GAPS is the resolution to this problem. So underlying that issue is there is a gut issue. There is an issue with digestive enzymes, stomach acids, gut bacteria, um, that, you know, all of this, that underlying foundational issue is a GAPS issue and that is resolved on GAPS. So, SIBO is resolved on GAPS um, and you may have to limit or reduce foods that cause too much pain and bloating and there can be specific things to focus on like, for example, milk kefir is really beneficial for pushing SIBO along. Um, so, but over, overall, GAPS is the answer to healing the underlying issues that are causing the SIBO. And it may be an issue that you, this um, person might need to work with a practitioner on. Because also, like, they could look into potentially hydrochloric acid supplementation. For yeah, the then it's likely they're going to need that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So, that kind of stuff, you definitely need to work with a practitioner if that you're going to go down, down that road because yeah that's an approach that you would take some for people who have small intestinal bacteria overgrowth they can supplement with hydrochloric acid which sounds scary that you're taking extra acid for something that you know you're getting acid reflux already but putting in the extra acid brings the numbers back in check as well that's exactly right and then and there could be um overgrowth of things that need to be targeted a little bit um mm. like h pylori is right. um, helicobacter pylori is something that if people have been on protein pump inhibitors, if they've got burping and um, and hiccuping and those kind of symptoms after eating, if they have gastritis and or um, hernias in their stomach, then that can be a sign that there's H pylori, which would need to be addressed as well. So mm -hmm. it can be it can be complex, but definitely gaps is the answer. Great. Um we move on to another question. What foods do you find cause headaches slash migraines slash auras? And do you know of any that help people recover from them? Just wondering if there are any trigger foods that I'm missing cheap. Okay. So it's not necessarily that we'd look at there being foods in particular that would cause it, but histamines can impact on migraines um, so they are something that when it comes to looking at foods that you're having um, with when migraines are an issue, that reducing histamines is something that might need to happen. But that's only resolving a symptom. It's not getting to the underlying issue, which the underlying issue is a gut issue, of course. Mm -hmm. And migraines are related to toxicity in the gut so um, and toxicity in the colon. So coffee enemas are something that Dr. Natasha really highly recommends for headaches. 
Um, so I, when it comes to animes, I just direct people to gaps.me and you can go and read about them there. Um, so, and if you go to that and go to the FAQs and type in migraines, then, um, Dr. Natasha does talk about how to do a coffee enema and why she recommends that clearing out the bowel. Um, but basically the things that cause headaches are things like the histamines, it can be hormones, um, you know, the rapid change in hormones during your cycle. But what it comes down to is that the reason those things are triggering it is because there's too much toxicity in the body. So that following gaps resolves that toxicity, um, reduces that amount of toxicity and doing things like coffee animas can be very helpful. In, um, also, like this, um, I think there's some stuff that you can look at um, if you're doing all the food things right and you're still getting them. There's, it's worth, worth a while looking at a holistic dentist to check for any dental stress, uh, look for any inner ear infections that you might not be aware of, things that are going on in, in the you know, head area um, that you just don't know that maybe you've got a feeling that's not working anymore like it needs replacement or there's some kind of tooth infection that you, you're not aware of these all these things could contribute to headaches and migraines as well so apart from having the the gut being directly causing the headache there could be other stuff in, in your head right yeah 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 great um we've got a um a question about putting weight gain so um, the question is, if there's time, maybe Elise could talk a little bit more about the weight gain on caps with too much protein. Okay. So I guess like we talked a little bit about just before when we're talking about the protein, um, I do think most people in general are probably eating too much protein and that can contribute to weight gain. But it is really important to think about where you are at on your journey. So when I talk about weight gain on gaps, um, if it's earlier in someone's healing journey, if they're in the first, even in the first year, I'm really encouraging them as hard as I know it is to ignore the weight gain, to try not to worry too much about it and understand that when we're detoxing, um, our body is trying to pull out this toxicity. It needs to store it in fat. There is going to be fluctuations in our in our weight going up and down whilst the body's really focused on healing. So it's something that I really try and divert people from worrying too much about um, in those early stages and that I, I wouldn't be encouraging anyone to limit the proteins and that's why sometimes I don't like talking about the high protein and the weight gain and gaps because I don't want people just to hear that statement and without hearing the explanation and go, oh, I'm eating too much protein on gaps and then start limiting it and then impeding their healing journey, which is what would happen if they started to worry too much about the proteins in those healing stages and start really limiting them. So um, in those stages, I really encourage people as much as they can, don't worry and look at addressing other things like adrenals and thyroid um, and things like that that can all have a big impact on weight gain and metals and things like that. So it's as we're getting used into the journey that people are finding that weight gain is continuing, then I really start addressing things. And I will look at their protein intake and we'll start to adjust and just see how they feel. Um, and again, I'm really careful with this because I don't like saying that and then having people start really limiting the weight, like restricting their protein and limiting the way they're eating, which is we can get in that headspace when something's about weight gain that we can start going, oh, I'm just going to really limit that because I really don't want to put any more weight. But um, Yeah, that's, okay. that's a really big psychological focus. Yeah. On the wellness journey is the way that the body looks and weight gain. You know, like, and, yeah. Um, maybe just um, can you talk to us about what's a healthy way to look at this psychologically during the, the healing journey, apart from like what you do with the clients? Um, what do you like recommend to them how, how they should be thinking about it? So when it comes to looking at if it's the protein intake that is causing the weight gain, I, I encourage people rather than setting something in their mind of, okay, protein's making me put on weight, I'm going to start limiting it, to just rather than do that, to look at what they're eating during the day and start, start questioning how is this making me feel. So I eat dinner. Was that too much? How would I feel if I ate less? How do I feel if I ate more vegetables and less of the meat? How do I feel if I, you know, go a day without eating meat? How do I feel if I have it once a day? So trying to keep the important thing in their, in their mind with it is not 
I got to limit protein because I'm putting on weight. Keeping it as how is my body feeling? And it can be just an over overeating of food altogether. And I think that is something that was what I was doing. I was overeating just full stop. Um, and so for me, I just started experimenting with, do I actually want breakfast? No, I think I could actually go without, even though I would enjoy eating it because I like the food. Um, I'm actually fine without it. So I'm going to not have breakfast today and then get to lunch, really enjoy my lunch, have my dinner. You know, that I do that some days, uh, most days where it's become two meals now where, and then, and then, you know, different parts of my cycle, like I was saying before, where I will want to eat three times a day. Um, so that's the way I encourage people to look at it when they're getting to that point in their journey, either if you're just already on a whole food diet, you're not really doing gaps to kind of start looking at it like that because when we're on a whole food diet, it's very, very nourishing and I don't think we need to eat as often or as much as we do. Um, and if you're well on your way with gaps and through the through the kind of healing phases of it, um, then start looking at that and, and just looking at that with that healthy questioning rather than that I'm deciding to limit this because of this um, and then just limiting it no matter how you're feeling. Um, I think it's really important to be listening to how your body's feeling and responding to it. And also there are certain instances when we have a really deceiving image of how we look really like we we have a very strange way of looking at, at ourselves and we can be quite harsh in judging that hey we're overweight and uh, that's a big, big problem for us i've met so many people who look absolutely amazing and still think they have weight issues and um, it's one of those things that also need uh, to be looked at if this is something that you're struggling with like what's the reality and what is it that's psychological for you and maybe so look for some someone to support you um to to go through some kind of counseling around body image issues too because that yeah 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 absolutely and again to highlight thyroid adrenal stress they're they're big players there i know we just talked a lot about the protein intake and the food intake but if you have chronic stress in your life and weight is an issue that is driving it. Like you cannot keep chronic stress going in your life and it can be low grade. So when you know, it's not like you're walking around stressed all the time, but just that low grade kind of stress in your life that's there all the time and weight and you're feeling like you're putting on weight with gaps, um, then you that, that, that is what needs to be addressed more than anything before you even look at your food intake is address the stress because that is like the most important thing you can be looking at. And then thyroid, adrenals, iodine, um, I, anyone that's having issues with weight gain, I put straight onto the iodine protocol because mm -hmm. they usually have a whole lot of other symptoms like brain fog, memory loss, hair falling out, um, other symptoms that tell us it's an iodine issue. So they're all the things that I would be more wanting to really focus on and address before I'd even look at the food um, and the food intake awesome. really seriously, yeah. Awesome, Elise. Thank you so much. Um, we could keep going forever, obviously, but um, we'll stop here. We'll have you again soon for another episode, as we always do. Elise, really? Be... Again? Oh, Me? Well, I'm so blessed. <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, how can people find you if they want to work with you? So if they want to work with me, I am taking some one-on-one, -on -one, uh, like one-off sessions for people who are experienced with GAPS so they can just book in a one-off appointment. Um, and for people that are new to GAPS, I do work in a 12-week program, but you can book a free initial consult and I can fill you in about how that all works. So you can find me at www.elisecomerford.com. Mm -hmm. and it is getting closer to Christmas now. I only take on a couple of families over the Christmas break. A lot of people like to start gaps over the Christmas break, particularly intro with their kids because um, you get that longer break with everyone at home. So if you are wanting to do gaps with your family, now would be the time to book in for the free initial chat, and I only take a couple of families over that time, so I can have a bit of a break too. Awesome, Elise. Thank you so much for joining us, and we will talk to you very, very soon. Okay, thanks, Boo. Bye-bye. Bye. This has been a production of TheWellnessCouch.com. Check us out on Facebook and join in the conversation on Facebook.com forward slash TheWellnessCouch. Subscribe to each show on iTunes and check us out on Twitter. The Wellness Couch, streaming wellness into your lives.
Foster Wellness Couch presenter endeavor to provide accurate and helpful information to their listeners. These podcasts cannot take into account individual circumstances and are not intended to be a substitute for health and medical advice from a qualified health professional. You should always seek the advice of a qualified health professional before acting on any of the information provided by any of the Wellness Couch podcasts.